Hi, I'm Jeff Klein, editor of Radio Graphics. And today I'm pleased to have with us Dr. Aaron Ruttman from the University of Washington uh, Department of Radiology, who is the author uh, of one of our featured papers in the current March 2018 issue of Radio Graphics. And his paper is entitled The Imaging and Management of Blunt Cerebrovascular Trauma. Aaron, thank you for joining us today. Yep, thank you. So Aaron, your paper on the imaging of uh, blunt cerebrovascular trauma deals primarily with injuries to the carotid and vertebral arteries, which as you state in the paper, are pretty uncommon even in trauma patients. Nevertheless, the sequelae of missing these injuries is could be pretty significant uh, you know, given their importance. Can you give us some background on how these serious injuries occur? What other injuries are most often associated with uh, cerebrovascular injuries? and what the pathophysiology is behind the arterial injuries themselves? Sure, yeah. Um, so blunt cerebrovascular injuries, which I'll just refer to as BCVI, are pretty rare, but they're likely not as rare as we once thought. Over the last 20 years or so, we found that the more we look and the better we are at looking with more advanced CT technology, uh, the more we find. So in the age of screening, studies have shown you know, higher incidences of BCVI and blunt force trauma patients compared to earlier studies. Um, back in the 90s or so, they were finding around a tenth of a percent of, of patients were having these injuries, and then more recent studies, more like one to two percent. So a whole order of magnitude, and of course, the incidence is even higher in an, an appropriate, appropriately um, selected screening population. So sure. how do they occur? Obviously, it's going to be most common in cases of high-energy trauma. Um, motor vehicle collisions, not surprisingly, account for more than 50% of injury mechanisms. And other mechanisms include falls from height, assaults, um, hanging suicide attempts, other direct head and neck trauma. And it's poorly understood, but much more rarely you can see these types of injuries with low energy mechanisms or with rapid head movement, the classic example being chiropractic manipulation. Um, so what injuries are associated with BCVI, the most important? Important association is cervical spine injury, in particular upper C-spine fractures from C1 to C3 and any ligamentous injury or fracture subluxation. Uh, any fracture which extends to include the transverse foramen as well. And so that in this, in this population, the incidence has been reported as high as 8%. So lots of other injuries have been identified as risk factors, um, including diffuse axonal injury, unexplained stroke on CT or MRI, Lefort facial fractures, basal or skull fractures, occipital condyle fractures, lots of other fractures that we can discuss. Um, and the pathophysiology you asked about, um, the vessel trauma is usually related to longitudinal stretching or twisting or compression forces to the vessel. So that can tear and disrupt the intimal layer of the vessel. And when the intima is injured, luminal blood can dissect into the wall at the site of the uh, defect and propagate cranially. And of course, this can cause problems in a couple of ways. As the false lumen expands, it can narrow and even occlude the true lumen of the vessel. And plus, the exposure of luminal blood to the thrombogenic subendothelial materials can lead to thrombosis and subsequent embolization to intracranial vessels and stroke. Uh, alternatively, the adventitia and media of the vessel can be injured without involvement of the intima, and this can lead to intramural hematoma um, from injury to the vasovasorum of the vessel. And then you have traumatic pseudoaneurysms, which occur when there's disruption of some of the layers of the vessel. And the blood dissects through the breach, and there's an outpouching contained by the adventitia or outer walls of the vessel. And then finally, direct laceration to the vessel, by, usually by fractured bone fragments, um, can injure the vessel and even transect it, which is obviously a, a devastating injury. Sure. Well, thanks for that. Um, so, Aaron, in the early part of your paper, you detail the screening of these injuries. Can we talk a little bit about the various screening recommendations that you describe in the paper? And we'll also take a look at table one, which details some of the signs and symptoms uh, and risk factors that are associated with these uh, cerebrovascular injuries. Yeah. Um, so it gets a little confusing. Over the last 20 years, several professional organizations and research groups have put forth some identified criteria. The original Denver criteria that most people are familiar with and the subsequent modified Denver criteria are based on studies conducted in the late 90s and early 2000s by the uh, University of Colorado group. Um, and then the Western Trauma Association published official screening recommendations in 2009 based on the Denver criteria. 
So the criteria are separated into signs and symptoms and objective risk factors in asymptomatic patients. And so you can see in table one, signs and symptoms include uh, arterial hemorrhage from the neck, nose, and mouth, expanding cervical hematoma, cervical brui in a younger patient under 50 years old, a focal neurologic deficit, um, ischemic stroke on CT or MRI, and then neurologic deficit inconsistent with the head CT. So all these things might uh, might prompt you to, to get some screening. And then that's as opposed to the identified risk factors in asymptomatic patients. Um, and so those are going to be the things that we find um, on the initial imaging. So like displaced Fort two and three fractures, basal or skull fractures with carotid canal involvement, diffuse axonal injury with a low Glasgow coma score. And then additionally, like we discussed earlier, the cervical spine fractures and subluxations, um, especially the upper C spine with ligamentous injury or involved in the transverse foramen. Then there's a few things that we should probably screen when it has to do with the injury mechanism, like a near hanging with anoxia or a clothesline type injury. And then there's some a little bit of a controversy, but some people think a seatbelt abrasion um, with swelling is, is enough to, to get screening, whereas one paper showed that it probably wasn't something that should prompt you to get screening. So, And then... Over the course, even in the last few years, there have been more papers showing that there's a few other things that per should probably be added, which you can see at the bottom of the table there. Um, things like uh, double fractures, complex skull fractures, scalp to gloving, thoracic vascular injuries, and TBI with thoracic injuries. So we're probably not done as far as finding things that are going to be on the list for screening. And then... Um, Another important set of guidelines is from the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, which you can just call EAST, E-A-S-T, which established recommendations based on the level of evidence. So they have a level one, two, and three recommendations based on how good the evidence is. And notably, most studies on BCBI are based on cohort studies and case control studies, uncontrolled retrospective studies. So EAST actually can't make any level one recommendations. There are no good level one recommendations for, for screening and for BCVI, but they do give a level two recommendation for screening a trauma patient in the event of an unexplained neurologic symptom or arterial epistaxis after trauma. And then a few level three recommendations um, for cases of DAI, so the diffuse axonal injury, with a uh, low Glasgow coma score, less than eight, Petrous bone fracture, upper cervical spine fracture, transverse foramen fracture, cervical subluxation, Lefort two and three fracture. Um, so there, as you can see, the EAST recommendations don't quite cover everything that the uh, WTA does and that the Denver group advocates, uh, not to mention the particulars and wording is a little different. So, for example, the WTA says skull base fracture involving the carotid canal, while EAST says petrous bone fracture. And obviously, the idea is the same, but in practice, the actual patients included in screening using the different wording will be slightly different. So, um, you know, it's it's up to the uh, it's up to the institution whether they're they're going to have to decide how they want to implement the guidelines based on their own experience and patient population and where they want to fall on the ROC curve. Sure. Well, great. Well, thanks for that. So, Aaron, you review the various imaging modalities that can be utilized to evaluate. Uh, patients with potential blunt uh, cerebrovascular injury. Uh, can you address the relative roles of angiography, uh, CT angiography, MR angiography, and give us some details on the current role in particular of CT angiography in this particular setting? Sure. So um, historically, catheter angiogram has been the gold standard for BCVI detection. It provides the highest spatial resolution and highest sensitivity. But of course, it's invasive and carries some inherent risks. So if we can do just as well or nearly as well with non-invasive imaging, um, we should be doing that for our screening tool. Um, early on, CTA was simply not adequate. It performed poorly when compared to the DSA gold standard. In fact, EAST provides a level two guideline specifically stating that four slice and less CTA are inadequate for screening. Um, but as CT technology has improved with more detectors, allowing for more rapid acquisition, better spatial resolution, the sensitivity and specificity for BCVI detection has improved a lot. So on a 16 to 64 channel um, CT, sensitivity has been shown as high as 98% and specificity as high as 100%, with you know, some studies lower, obviously. 
but the majority of missed injuries are low grade injuries in those cases. So, and East gives a level three recommendation for the use of an eight plus eight or greater slice CTA as a screening modality. So it is the recommended tool for screening modality as long as you have, you know, a fairly current uh, CT scanner to be doing the, the screening. Uh, as for MRI, of course, it's great for diagnosing brain infarction. That's that's where it's going to come in and in these cases uh, most handily. But standard time of flight MRA has performed poorly for detecting BCBI with sensitivities between 50 and 75 percent. So standard MRI that most of us are doing is simply not adequate as a screening tool. However, I will say that in recent years, high-resolution vessel wall imaging has been developing, and these technologies can play an important role. So they're more likely to be used in conjunction with luminal imaging, like CTA or MRA, um, to really get a good look at the vessel wall itself. So perhaps MRI at the moment is not a great screening tool, but there's a ton of potential as a follow-up tool or to help differentiate equivocal findings um, from the CTA or DSA. You know, to get a good look, not just the vessel lumen, but the injured vessel wall itself. Sure. Terrific. Well, thanks. So let's go ahead and discuss the specific imaging findings that are associated with arterial injury. And we'll review the Denver grading scale. You've touched on that. Uh, we'll also look at table two and at figure six as you detail the findings uh, in this particular example. Okay, great. Well, let's start with figure six um, so we can see the spectrum of vessel injuries. Um, in A, um, so-called minimal intimal injuries, you can see focal or segmental wall thickening with minimal luminal narrowing. And then in B, a thrombus or focal hematoma can develop at the site of intimal injury causing luminal narrowing. In C, this shows a classic di dissection in which you have a raised displaced intimal flap and dissection with a false lumen. In D, you, the intima is intact, and there's a long segment of intramural hematoma and wall thickening with narrowing of the lumen. E shows a pseudoaneurysm. Like I said, it's a contained focal outpouching through a disrupted vessel wall. F shows a dissection which has progressed to occlusion. So the false lumen or intramural hematoma expands to the point of, of, of occluding the true lumen. And then finally in G, this is rare, but the entire vessel wall can be transected, allowing for free extravasation. Um, so let's, let's put these in the Denver grading scale now in uh, table two. When you see vessel wall injury with less than 25% stenosis of the lumen, this is a grade one injury. So there's often called minimal intimal injury, um, where you have a small hematoma or injury to the wall, but the narrowing of the lumen is less than 25%. So if the stenosis is greater than 25%, it automatically becomes a grade two injury. And additionally, the presence of a raised intimal flap or the presence of any intraluminal thrombus automatically qualifies it for a grade two injury, regardless of the degree of stenosis. Um, a pseudoaneurysm is a grade three injury. When the vessel is occluded, it's grade four. And finally, arterial transection is grade five. And then, in addition, the presence of any arteriovenous fistula qualifies as a grade five injury. Great. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of cases that illustrate some of these findings. We'll, we'll begin with dissection with a raised intimal flap, and we'll put up figure 11, which I think nicely demonstrates some of the findings you've, uh, you've just described. Sure. Uh, so this case shows the typical findings of intimal dissection. Uh, with raised intimal flap. So this is a 30-year-old male. He was brought in with Lafort two facial fractures after being hit in the face with a boulder. And there's a linear feeling defect you can see in the right common carotid artery with a false lumen. Um, note that although the appearance is typical, the location in the common carotid is not. It's much more common to see dissections in the internal carotid artery. Um, and note also that the presence of a displaced intimal flap automatically makes this a grade two injury, even though there's really no significant luminal narrowing. Right. And let's go ahead and move to figure 19, which is a case of a vertebral artery transection with an arteriovenous fistula formation uh, after trauma. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting case. Um, a really bad polytrauma with fracture dislocation at C4-5. Uh, on the CTA, you can see extravasation and hematoma centered in the transverse foramen at C4-5. The patient went to catheter angiography, and the middle image there shows a, a right vertebral artery injection 
with contrast spilling out at the level of the fracture dislocation. And so this represents transection, a grade five injury. And when the left vertebral artery is injected, you can see the retrograde flow goes to the level of the transection and no further. So it, it can't get past the transection, obviously. Um, and then in the next part of the image, the digital subtraction images, there's three subsequent phases in the right vertebral artery injection. And you can see even in the earliest arterial phase on the left, you can start to see some venous filling in the vertebral venal, venous plexus, which becomes more obvious on the subsequent phases as the high arterial flow fills the entire vertebral venous plexus system on both sides and drains into the internal jugular system. So this is an arterial venous fistula and transection. So both of those things qualify it as a grade five injury. Great. Thanks for that. You know, an important component of your paper uh, review some of the mimics and the imaging pitfalls and artifacts that can mask or can simulate uh, vascular injury in these patients. Uh, figure 21 shows a case of a subtle injury to a redundant portion of the cervical ICA. Can we review this case and its findings? Sure. Yeah, this is a difficult thing because diagnosing BCVI can immediately change the treatment trajectory for a patient. So it creates treatment decisions where you might have to weigh treating with aspirin or heparin in a patient who has fractures and maybe bleeding somewhere else. So we want to be sure, as sure as possible when we call it. And artifacts and things like atherosclerosis and spasm can make it tricky. And this, this particular case illustrates a, another tricky thing, a fairly common entity coiled or looped vascular segments, which we often see in the distal cervical internal carotid arteries, especially in hypertensive patients. And the loops can mimic a pseudoaneurysm, especially when viewed on axial, where you can see the same artery twice in cross-section. But it can also conceal injuries and make them more difficult to distinguish, like in this case. So here you see a bump of a pseudoaneurysm directed medially from the coiled segment and if you're not careful and don't look at it in multiple planes, it's pretty easy to lose it among the other uh, vessel segments. Right. And the, the MIP reconstructions are also quite helpful in these types of cases. Right. Terrific. So you know, after a discussion of the medical, interventional, and surgical management and treatment of these conditions, uh, you review some of the imaging follow-up issues, particularly for low-grade injuries. Can we look at two cases here, uh, which are figures 24 and 25? which show different uh, outcomes in two different patients, each of whom sustained uh, a low-grade injury. Yeah. Uh, so follow-up imaging is an important part of continued evaluation of BCBI. The injuries often evolve one way or the other, and the changes in imaging appearance will serve to guide changes in treatment. So these are two examples of low-grade injuries, usually defined as grade one or grade two injuries. And as a general rule, <clears throat> excuse me, Low-grade injuries are more likely to heal or improve than high-grade injuries. So up to 75% of grade 1 injuries will heal, and over a third of grade 2 injuries will heal or improve to grade 1 over the first month, whereas only 11% of grade 3 injuries improve, so not nearly as many. On image 24 here, uh, on the left, you can see an oblique sagittal CTA MIP of the right carotid. There's a focal intramural hematoma, which causes somewhere between 25 and 50% luminal narrowing. So this is a grade two injury. And then the patient was treated with antiplatelet anti therapy and followed up imaging three, three months later. So the one on the right is three months later, and it shows almost complete healing of the injury. So that's in contrast to, to image 25 here. There's a, a polytrauma patient came in with a right occipital condyle fracture, an adjacent vertebral artery injury. And you can see on, on the left image, the initial injury shows focal intramural hematoma with about 25 to 50% narrowing, kind of a borderline grade one, grade two injury. And then just seven days later, the follow-up CTA, the CTA in the middle, you can see, as well as on the right, the rendered 3D uh, recon shows progression of the injury. So we went from a grade two injury to a grade three injury. We now see a pseudoaneurysm. Right. Terrific. Well... Dr. Aaron Rutman, I want to thank you for taking your time today to discuss with us your paper, which appears in the current March 2018 issue of Radiographics, which deals with the imaging of blunt cerebrovascular trauma. Aaron, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.